Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. Uh, Today actually is March 17th. It's St. Patrick's Day that this interview is being released. And it's not your typical St. Patrick's Day, obviously, with all that's going on in the world and the coronavirus and, and the news changing every single hour, it feels like, with this story and certainly how it's affected the sports world. And uh, we've been taping a bunch of interviews on Sports Spectrum well before uh, the coronavirus, that uh, that news. And we have probably 15 or 20 interviews you know, that are in the can that are set to be released over the next couple months that we're going to continue to release to you. They're new interviews. They're fresh. There's a lot of great stories and a lot of great testimonies of people uh, in their faith. But we also want to do some more updated interviews that talk about current events and things like the coronavirus that's going on right now in the world. And so today, we bring to you an interview that we did yesterday, March 16th, with Dave Pash. He is a broadcaster with ESPN, a play-by-play voice. He does NBA games, and he does college basketball games, does college football games as well. And he's also one of the radio voices of the Arizona Cardinals in the NFL. Dave's a very recognizable voice around the sports world, especially those that are in the business and have been for many years. Now, Dave was set to call the Sacramento Kings versus New Orleans Pelicans game in Sacramento last week, last Wednesday with Richard Jefferson. That game, of course, was postponed immediately after learning about the coronavirus infecting Rudy Gobert and the Utah Jazz again last Wednesday, March 11th. So we're still less than a week since that incident happened. And then everything kind of changed after that, right? There was basically no more sports within 24 hours of that incident. And um, Dave was at the center of that working with ESPN. And he joins us now uh, to talk about all that's taken place. Dave, welcome to Sports Spectrum. Good to be on, Jason. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Considering where we all are, I'm doing as well as I guess any of us can hope we would be doing. Um, we had you back on in 2018, and you told your your story of faith then. And this is obviously a different kind of conversation. Um, you were getting ready to call. I guess start with going back just about a week ago. We're taping this Monday afternoon, March 16th. You were you're getting ready to call the Kings Pelicans game for ESPN March 11th. And everything changed. Can you can you kind of just go back to like leading up to that game and um, kind of all that transpired from your perspective? It was a it was a crazy day. We uh, I was calling the game with Richard Jefferson, our yep. producer Ken Wolf, uh, Richard, and I all went to lunch, and we were talking about wow, it's looking like the NBA is going to have games played with no fans. That's kind of what we were thinking. That you know sooner than later here. Uh, the NBA is going to play games and there aren't going to be fans there. And that's as, as bad as we thought it was going to get. Yeah. And then you know, this was probably at about two o'clock Pacific time. <laughs> and we went to the arena at about five o'clock. And as we were driving to the arena, uh, we, we are on Twitter, uh, Richard and I, we start talking about, why did you see what's going on? in the Oklahoma city, Utah game, something must have happened Hmm. for them not to be playing this game right now. So, and then we get to the arena, we meet with the coaches and we're still talking about, you know, what could possibly happen here. And, uh, one of the coaches mentioned that he thought there was a good chance the NBA would just shut down given what's happening with this Utah Oklahoma city game. And at that point we still didn't know all the details. We come out of our production meeting and a member of the front office and one of the teams tells us the NBA just uh, postponed all all games. So this was about an hour before tip off. So we, and they say they postponed all games, you know, after tonight. So we're thinking, okay, we're going to be the last, we're going to be the last game. So we go and kind of rehearse our open and trying to figure out the right tone because at that point, you still have a game to play. It is an important game. It was a game that impacted the eighth seed in the West. It was New Orleans and Sacramento, but also you have the virus. So how do you set this tone of, hey, this is the last game, last chance to watch the NBA for a while. Um, And then all of a sudden about, 20 minutes or so before tip off, maybe even closer to tip off. Uh, Pat McGrath, who's one of the best stats guys in the country, he has worked with uh, Jim Nance 
uh, on the final four for CBS for 30 years. He's done like 30 Super Bowls. He, he's outstanding. Yeah. He's worked with all of us at ESPN. He, he comes back. He says, I don't think the Pelicans are coming out of their locker room because I heard somebody telling the players to stay in the locker room. Hmm. And I look and I look at the clock and there's about 11 minutes on the clock. I see the Kings warming up. The Pelicans aren't warming up. And so we start to take this seriously and think, well, what's going on here? And then there's a tweet And forgive me for taking too long on this, but I just think it's kind of interesting to set the stage to give people a feel for kind of how we're handling it. No, this is fine. Breaking live. Somebody, I think it was Sam uh, Amick, tweets out that one of the officials, Courtney Kirkland, worked the Utah game on Monday against Toronto. And the Pelicans don't want to play because of that. Now, we could not get confirmation from the Pelicans, but as Scott Van Pelt throws it to us, and now we are about two minutes before we're supposed to start the game, The Pelicans still aren't out there. And all of a sudden, as we're on live, I see Mark Davis, the crew chief. I see one of the other officials. I don't see Courtney. And then I see Alvin Gentry, but no players. Hmm. And then all of a sudden, the Kings go back to the locker room. And still, we're not getting any information from anybody. So we're left to kind of describe it to the audience as we're seeing it happen. I mean, we're on camera, and I'm kind of looking around (laughs) If people watching are probably like, what's he What's he looking at? But I'm trying to see who is on the court, who's not, who's leaving the court. And then all of a sudden, you can kind of hear them announce the game's been postponed. There were some boos, but not a lot. And then about another minute later, they announce it louder. So I don't know if, if, if something was not working with sound system at that point, but they announce it. And all of a sudden, everybody starts booing. And the the players walk off the floor, except Lonzo Ball now emerges from the locker room and comes onto the court to start shooting. So it's just really hmm. surreal. Uh, it just and then obviously, you know, we, we from then on had to do, I think, one or two more hits and we were, we were out of there. It's just never been in that situation before and never thought, you know, that things would rapidly uh, turn in that direction from two o'clock that afternoon to you know, eight o'clock at that point or whatever it was locally. Well, that changed everything in the sports world from basically the time when you and Richard are together and seeing the story and the news um, with the jazz and Rudy Gobert. And all of a sudden that just changes everything. And it escalated so quickly. I can't even begin to, to ask you if you have anything to compare this to, but is there anything you can compare this to? You've been doing this broadcast thing for a long time. I, I'm trying to think, I mean, I've, you know, called games in strange circumstances um, I've called games, you know, doing the first game after Joe Paterno was fired in the wake of the Jerry Sandusky news. I'm not comparing this to that. I'm just saying sure. in terms of, uh, being in an environment where, you know, you just don't, you're, you're not, you're trying to set the right tone and you don't know how things are going to play out. That's what it felt like for that two minutes before, uh, the game was supposed to tip off where things are unfolding and you just don't know how it's going to end. And you're trying to deliver it to the audience while you're taking in the information that I, I would say that was comparable because, you know, during the week, you just, things were changing rapidly going into that, that Penn state Nebraska game. Yeah. And even on the air, there was a, you know, w- the game was supposed to kick off and there was a, a prayer between both teams that, you know, we went on for about a minute. We just carried it live, and Chris Buell and I were doing the game, and we just were quiet uh, for that minute, minute and a half, and we didn't know that was coming. It just So I would say that was similar in terms of just not, not knowing, but obviously having a game postponed slash canceled right in front of your eyes before it was supposed to take place, I, I had never been a part of anything like that. Dave Pash is our guest here from ESPN on our Sports Spectrum broadcast today. Um, when did this start hitting your radar? I, I just – I haven't talked to a lot of people about this. We've been, you know, recording a ton of interviews that were all done basically before the coronavirus sort of, you know, became a thing and became on our radar. I think for me, it started coming on the radar uh, about a week or so ago. I remember being in church, uh, I guess it would be on the 8th of March, and we had our, that was our last church gathering inside the church. And we were starting to pay attention a little more to making sure that we weren't shaking hands and no high fives and no hugs and bringing sanitizer into church. But there was never a thought that we weren't going to be able to gather, I think, even at that point until about the middle of the week. But it was on the radar for you. When when did that start really becoming something that you were watching and paying attention to, especially for a guy who's traveling and doing a lot of different games? 
Yeah, great question, Jason. I, I it, it was on my radar in the sense of just thinking, okay, how is this going to end? And if the NBA does, because I still I was supposed to have a game Sunday night, uh, Lakers Denver, right? And so I was kind of on my radar. Uh, I guess that that Wednesday in, during the Kings Pelicans game, thinking about okay, well Sunday will will there be a game? Will I be traveling? Uh, will I be doing the game from a remote site? Uh, a Remy is how we call it in the business yeah. uh, because you know there are a limited number of people who can be in the arenas. I mean, I, I started thinking about all this, but I guess it just never really got to the point where it seemed like it was real, and even now. It doesn't seem real. It just yeah. it almost feels like you're in a movie, you know, where um, you're seeing someone else's life kind of play out. And uh, I, I don't know when it's really going to hit home. I mean, it hasn't even been a week. What's it going to be like when it's been a month and there's no games? Um, you know, I think in in Arizona, it, it seems like for a lot of people, I don't want to say it's business as usual, but I mean, there's still people going out. Uh, restaurants are still open as of now. Uh, people are still going to the gym. Uh, you know, it, I, I think people are obviously being very careful. Uh, a lot of the grocery stores, you know, are out of toilet paper. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it, I, I, if I was in New York city or Los Angeles, I'd probably feel a little bit differently. I've got two daughters in college and, and the Los Angeles area, and they're, they're definitely experiencing different circumstances than I am here. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next few weeks. But I don't feel like it's still, and maybe you feel the same way, and I'm sure there's probably others out there too. It it just doesn't seem real right now. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I think I'm in Connecticut, um, you know, five to ten minutes from the the headquarters of ESPN, and they, you know, even just now as we taped this a couple hours ago tonight, they they made a new decoration at all restaurants and and bars. We're going to be closing as of eight o'clock, and only doing the restaurants would only be doing, you know drive by or pick up service or take out uh, gyms are closed here now, you know, as of eight o'clock tonight. So all of these things are happening. It's the fluidity of this is just crazy. If things are happening every hour, it seems like there's another new announcement, another new update from, you know, our government or president or whoever it is like we're in a movie and it's very bizarre. Um, I want to twist it a little bit into the faith perspective and I want people to go back to 2018. We had you on, it was in the summer when you, presumably would have more time it was before you were it was right after you finished the NBA and before you were going back to your football coverage for that year and you told your faith story so obviously having you on this show we know that you're a man of faith but where is that for you in all this in terms of uh, just I mean obviously your faith's strong my faith is strong but I don't know it feels like I'm clinging a little bit more to God's word now than I was even a week ago based upon all this it's certainly humbling, right? You, you realize you just how much is out of your control and, yeah. you know, how much you need to rely on God uh, at all times. And it's easy sometimes when things are going well and you have a set schedule and you have you feel like you have a little bit more control over your life to maybe compartmentalize God a little bit because we think we we have control over our situation. So it's definitely been humbling in, in that respect. And yes, uh, clinging to God's word more. Uh, I think the biggest thing, Jason, is it's it's an opportunity for us as believers. There are a lot of people right now that are anxious, restless, uh, uncertain, uh, many people that are legitimately hurting, that are losing uh, income, uh, their families are being impacted in a big way. And so I think it's an opportunity for us as Christians to uh, to step up. It's, it's kind of where the rubber meets the road. Step up and get out of our comfort, comfort zone a little bit and help people. You know, it, it's not always that we have an opportunity as believers um, where I think people will listen a little bit more, uh, where people are open a little bit more, and just, you know, lending a hand in a tangible way where, you know, we can support somebody who's struggling, uh, you know, maybe it, it, it lends an opportunity to witness. And even if we don't get to witness, just doing good, <laughs> just yeah. just lending a hand and helping somebody out. Uh, I think it's 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 a chance for all of us as, as believers to, to take advantage of that because 
there are people that legitimately are hurting and don't know where to turn. Yeah, and just a couple of days ago, you tweeted asking if there was a family in the Phoenix area, where presumably where you live, who will have whether lost income because of the coronavirus or can't pay a bill to message you. I'm wondering when you did that. First of all, that was awesome, and I thought, you know, it's funny how something like that, and it's it, it's a simple act, right? It's a gesture that maybe all of us should be thinking about every day, not just in a moment like this, and how it kind of you know, uh, goes and what doesn't go viral, but it picks up steam a little bit more like, Oh, that's so nice that he's doing that. It's like, yeah, we should all be doing this, uh, especially as believers. But I'm wondering what was the initial, uh, reaction, maybe the even in, in intention for the, what I call just a simply awesome tweet that you did and, and wondering if you were able to actually see that through and help some people. Yeah. So I, I talked to my wife, Hallie about it at the time, because I think at first, the last thing you want to do is is do something publicly and have, you know, feel like you're doing it to try to get attention. Correct. And and, yeah. and so I was hesitant at first. You know, I thought about it I'm like this would be a good way, first of all, the witness to to show that, you know, as believers, we, we want to help people. We want to love people. We want to share the love of God with people. Uh, how can how can we do that right now? Other than just tweeting out, hey, praying for people. Right. Yeah. Um so I thought this was a tangible way to physically help somebody uh, or, you know, multiple people and do it while getting nothing in return. And so and then I talked to my wife, you know, we thought, you know, maybe social media is a good way to do it and just kind of see where it goes. And the response has been overwhelming. We have been able to help a couple families. We, we obviously can't help everybody. Sure. And so I'm trying to think now and pray about what's you know, is there another step to take? Because I've had so many responses. And I guess the, the best way, I think, uh, to get the word out is if there's anybody out there that anybody, regardless of your occupation, uh, regardless of your income level, that if there is anybody that is willing to help pay a bill for somebody, it can be a, a $1 bill, it can be a $1,000 bill, whatever it is, uh, put it out there on Twitter and just you know, use social media to get the word out that, uh, you know, we want to help people. And if somebody has really been hurt by lost income, a lost occupation, uncertainty during this time with the virus, uh, open up your direct messages and have people DM you and then just go through them and try to see if you can respond to as many people as you can, get as much information as you can, and then pay a bill. And that's a way, you know, instead of giving somebody, you know, money directly, you, 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 you pay off a, a bill or help with rent or mortgage, whatever it might be. I think, I think that's the best way, you know, we thought about, do we set up like a GoFundMe and try to yeah. get money to other families? I, I just, I've never done that before. And I, and I don't even know if that's the right avenue to take. So I'm kind of at this point, not sure, Jason, what the next step is for us in terms of helping all the people that have responded to us. But maybe, again, the best way is just if anybody's willing to put it out there that they're happy to uh, give money uh, or pay off a bill, you know, we'll retweet it, we'll forward it, we'll try to get information to people who are, are looking to have uh, something uh, financially paid for. Yeah, it's such a hard time, too, because you want to help. You know, you can't help everybody. You feel bad if, you know, you get 100 responses on a post like that and you can only help 30 or 40. I'm making a number up here, obviously. But even I think about my church and we have some school bus drivers in our church here in Connecticut that um, are without job and they don't get paid if they don't have school and the kids are closed from school for at least a couple of weeks, probably longer and so how do we support them when we don't necessarily have all of the funds to be able to just throw out, you know, all the money that they need to have every month to survive, but yet we still want to help as the church. So it's a really tough situation, but I think you're right. I think the more everybody can do a little, that's where it can make a huge impact as opposed to everybody trying to please everyone all the time. Is that fair to say? It is. And that that's why I, I think initially the goal was, hey, can we help? a couple families, we put it out there, one family, but can, can we help a couple, three, four, uh, either with a major bill or a smaller bill just to get the ball rolling. And, and hopefully that would gain some steam and that others would chip in. Others would see, Hey, this is a great way to, to help somebody in a small way. And if we can all help one, two, three, four people, 
uh, it can do a lot of good. And, and that's why I think at this point now, what's, you know, what's the next step? I've got all these messages of people that are hurting and mm. we can only help, you know, some of them, not all of them. So what's the, what's the next step? So that everybody can at least have their story told and hopefully there'll be somebody to help everyone instead of like you're saying, um, you know, how difficult it is to try to have one person help a thousand. Sure. Yeah. I think even athletes, you know, the ones that are on that pedestal and you see a lot of athletes right now, you know, pledging to do great things. Zion has pledged to do a great thing with New Orleans and Kevin Love and a few others. And I'm sure there are more that we don't know about, which is certainly fine and great. And I'm sure there are guys who are and women who are trying to figure out how can I help? Where where can I get the the most results here and the influence? And sometimes it might just be what you're saying. It might just using an influence to say, hey, who wants to help pay a bill here? And everybody, like I said, pays one bill and and helps. And I love the the verse that you had you know, posted when your original tweet was Acts 2035. I'm just going to read it for people listening. It says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, that verse seems maybe an obvious one if I'm asking you why that verse, but why that verse? Why was that one the yeah. one that, that hit you? I was trying to think about what's what's a verse that's appropriate in terms of the situation. Yep. And um, I also thought, you know, sometimes when it's a situation where you've got people that might be more open to Scripture, I thought it was a good Scripture where it, you know, uses the name of Jesus rather than just, you know, something from Psalms. Not mm-hmm. that there's anything wrong with, you know, a, a passage and and or a psalm. I, I just thought yep. it uses the name of Jesus directly. It's quoting Jesus directly and, and just felt that, you know, the timing was good to be able to apply this verse as a witness. And also because it's true. I mean, as, as believers, we should be looking uh, to give and uh, you know, what a, what a great opportunity for us to share the love of Christ by giving. And I just thought it was applicable. And I also, again, thought, you know, and I originally, the, you know, I know Twitter's public, but it was just the whole balance of, you know, this isn't about me trying to get glory and people, you know, it's been nice. I've had people say, hey, you know, it's, it's a great thing you've done, but I, that wasn't the goal. Right. And, you know, you certainly, we, we did not want to try to make this about us. It's, it's about helping somebody else and hopefully others seeing it, uh, whether you're a Christian or not, others seeing it and, and saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to help somebody else. I'm going to pay for a bill for someone else as well, just to try to help people as much as possible. And, and, and ultimately, you know, it's, it's God's glory and not ours. Last couple of questions here with Dave Pash on sports spectrum. Um, this whole thing with your, you personally, I think I'm just curious with your job and, and how it could affect all of your plans in the sense of just from, a, for, again, from your perspective, you know, they're talking about games that could go into June, July, certainly June, but July, August. Uh, and here you are also a, a football uh, broadcaster as well. You've done work with the Cardinals and you certainly do college football work with ESPN. So has, have you begun to even think about what this is going to look like for you from that perspective? Or are we just not there yet? No, I've thought a lot about it. I think, you know, that was one of the other, uh, one of my other motives to, to, you know, publicly put this out there on Twitter was yeah. I think initially I was thinking so much about myself you know, the first 48 hours, it was like, oh, boy, how's this going to impact me? How's this going to impact my family? And thought, you know, I need to stop worrying about me. I'm supposed to be thinking about other people and how to serve others. And so I thought it was a great way to, you know, it's almost like you hold yourself accountable um, by saying, I'm going to serve somebody else yeah. and think about somebody else instead of focusing. Because, I mean, you can drive yourself crazy thinking so much about how this is going to impact me. And, you know, since that time, you know, it, it went from thinking the NBA might be back in a month to who knows if the NBA will be back at all and when it'll be back. And so, yeah, life is on hold. I, I don't know when the next time I'll work or travel. Um, and so I'm just trying to make the most of the time that I have here at home. It's normally a time I'd be busy, obviously. Yeah. And maybe this summer, June and July, when in previous years I've, I've been off and home, you know, I'll be busy then perhaps. So uh, it's just, you know, an uncertain time and not sure when things will uh, 
you know, I'm not sure when the NBA will pick up, not sure how this impacts college football or the NFL in the fall. Uh, so worrying about it though, is not going to help. <laughs> and so it's just trying to, you know, be prayerful and being in the word and enjoying the time you have with your family and seeing if there's real tangible ways to, to help others during this time. Yeah. Could you just finish this up here? This is la- the last question I have with some encouragement, maybe for, uh, maybe it's just for me, but maybe it's for those listening. I don't know if it's a prayer you've been praying lately. Um, you know, even some conversation with your wife and your family, but just some encouragement maybe for those that are listening as well. Um, obviously we're all in different situations in different places and maybe even different situations with our faith, but maybe just what's been on your heart lately. Jason, I think the biggest thing is, you know, we, we obviously have to take what, what's happening in our world very seriously, but there is also a, a tendency for a lot of us to overreact and to, you know, when we overreact, we tend to focus so much on ourselves. And I've just been trying to not think about how this impacts me and how this impacts my family. I think if all of us can start to think about, okay, how, you know, who out there is in a worse situation than me? Who out there can I help? Can I lend a hand to? And I think if we can focus on serving others, it's a great way for us to, to be unified as a community and as a country. And I also think that this is a time more than ever that, that we need to, uh, certainly as Christians, admit that we aren't in control and that this is why we rely on God and that God is bigger than this. Uh, he isn't surprised by this. Uh, this isn't spinning out of his control. He, he knew exactly what was coming. And this is a time where, as, a, as, a, as the body of Christ, we can be strengthened uh, by knowing that God is in control and that God loves us and that he's for us, uh, that things in, in this world aren't always going to go our, our way. Uh, we know, obviously, Scripture tells us as Christians that, you know, Jesus says, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Yeah. And that, that's been a great comfort to me, just remembering that he's in control, uh, not me. Uh, I don't have to fix every, every problem because I know that, that he's in control. But what I do have to do is I have to, this to me is where the rubber meets the road. And it's an opportunity as believers not to isolate, not to say, well, I'm going to take care of me, but to step out in faith and to comfort and to strengthen other people. And again, I think it's an opportunity for us as Christians to, to step out of our comfort zone and to, to lend a hand to people who are hurting. And that's the best witness I can think of right now. He is Dave Pash, ESPN play-by-play broadcaster. And uh, who knows when we'll see you calling a game again. We'll probably end up seeing you on, on re-airs because you got to fill programming with something. And I'm sure there's a lot of games that you've done that will be getting re-aired. But listen, this has been uh, wonderful to catch up, Dave, and under obviously weird circumstances. But uh, thank you for your voice. Thank you for the encouragement. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll get to do this again sometime. Well, I'm all good for, for re-airs because most of the re-airs have me with a full head of hair. And it's good to remember. <laughs> That's it's funny because nice I saw a game man. the other day that was re-aired. I don't remember what it was. And I'm like, oh, look at look at Dave Pash. And I, I got to be honest with you. I saw the hair and I was like, I think I, this must be a little while ago. <laughs> It's funny because I do look like a totally different person. I haven't aged as well as I thought, I guess, uh, too, when, you see, when you see the old footage. So. But any time, Jason. You got it, buddy. Thanks again. Okay. And that was Dave Pash, ESPN play-by-play broadcaster, NBA, college basketball, college football, and one of the, uh, one of the better guys you'll meet in the broadcasting business. And I love Dave. I love his heart for people. I love his heart for the Lord. And I loved his tweet the other day. It was March 14th when he simply put out that he wanted to help a family in the Phoenix area with some lost income, maybe pay a bill. And obviously, you can't help everybody. But imagine if every single person, and we have thousands of people every day that listen to this show, whether it's on the radio, whether it's through the podcast, imagine if every person who was able to could help someone else in need pay a bill. And maybe it's simply the $35 a month bill that you pay for your cable or whatever it is that might cost $35 each month. Maybe that's something that you can help with this month. So we're not taking a collection. We're not 
putting out a, a website that you can do that with. We're simply asking you to really search within your heart a way that you can help someone else who's in need during this time. Um, it's a weird time, right? It's a strange time, uh, but God is in control, as Dave said. You know, we are not in control. He's bigger than this. He's in control. He's a God of order, and he knows what is going on, and we're so grateful that we have a God that knows that, and we can trust in him. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.